Hey everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Hey everybody, welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is Christian Harloff. I'm super excited to be on the set of Collider for the first time, but I have to say I gotta give a very special Happy birthday wish to someone I've been a big fan of for a very long time, Ringo Starr. It's his birthday today. And <laughs> Highly birthday underrated Ringo drummer, Starr. ladies and gentlemen. Highly Woo! underrated drummer. It's a great drummer, Happy yeah. birthday, Ringo. Yeah, yeah. Also, here is Mark Ellis. It's somebody else's birthday today, too. Oh, okay. It's, That's uh, weird. Who's, I think it's Stallone's, isn't it? Uh, no. <laughs> Me, nice Stallone, try. and Ringo all have the same birthday, Reaching. so talent. <laughs> <laughs> well, first story of the day. When Warner Brothers and DC announced their upcoming slate of films, many film fans noticed that there were no standalone Batman or Superman films included. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Superman actor Henry Cavill said the following. There's plenty of time for individual Superman sequels. He's a tough character to tell. People like the darker vigilante. I think it speaks to the human psyche more easily rather than the godlike being that we can't really understand. Once we have a more expansive universe, we can delve more into the character of Superman and hopefully tell more stories. Christian, what do you make of Cavill's comments? I dig his comments because I, and more than just the human psyche, I look at the times as well too. And John, you're a wrestling fan, so I'll, I'll equate it to this. Like when uh, the WWE had Hulk Hogan back in the day, who was like the ultimate good guy. And then later on as the bad era, you got Stone Cold Steve Austin and people started to responding more to that anti-hero stuff. That's the age that we live in right now. So I think Henry Cavill's comments as far as that the darker tone and eventually we'll get to more super uh, superman movies yeah i i kind of understood that when they first announced that batman v superman was going to be basically what the movie was going to be about and everyone was like wait a minute is that is that the man of steel sequel then no and it's not because it, had it been the man of steel sequel then you're taken away from superman and really letting him develop more but i like the idea that you'll see standalone later and it'll give us time to set up this dcu which i do think they're doing a pretty good job of once we find out what happens in Batman v Superman, but to get this, this is how we're going to really jumpstart the, DC, the DCU. I'm all for it. So I, I really like his uh, his comments here, and I think that once you get developed and learn more about Superman, who will be popping into these movies more, then we want to see more of him because who knows who's going to pop up in this movie, Justice League. We'll want to see more of a standalone Superman movie down the line. Just for the record, I still say my prayers need my vitamins, brother. So, of course, of course. Um, <laughs> so, like, I, I actually really like, there's a lot of insight in these comments, actually. And here's, here's what makes them kind of fascinating. The Superman character, he points out, look, Superman's a tough one to do. And he's absolutely right, because there's a little bit of a Hulk element to him. The tr trouble, as Kevin Feige described it, in approaching a new Hulk movie, or even wanting to attempt to do a new standalone Hulk movie, is what do you do with the Hulk? I mean, the Hulk just took out a you know, horde of invading aliens, practically single-handedly. Yeah, the rest of the Avengers were there, but he was doing just fine on his own, taking out the flying worm and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you can do whatever. With Superman, what do you do with Superman? Who does Superman fight? Like, if you're not, because you can't have a Zod every single movie. Like, oh, there's a, also another incredible godlike being who can rip the planet apart if you really wanted to, and now Superman's got to fight him, and you do that every time. So it makes for an interesting dilemma, and I think that's what he's pointing out. And I like says, look, once you flesh out this DC universe a little bit more, then more options open up for telling Superman stories. And I think that's the dilemma that Brian Singer probably faced when he was making Superman Returns. Mm. And that's why ultimately in Superman Returns, it a movie which failed as a comic book movie, but I actually still got a lot out of the film myself because it was really more of a character study. It's more about the personal dilemmas that Superman faces rather than the arch enemies that he faces. And I think that's what he was going for and unfortunately it didn't click with a lot of people. But it's, so I like what he's saying and it makes sense that once you flesh out the universe, there'll be more options available to him. So I think he's bang on the money with these comments, Mark. Yeah, I'm going to give old man Henry some credit because I mean, you, there's so many actors that if you're playing Superman and you're in Man of Steel, you would whine and moan about the fact that you oh, now already we're going to jam Batman and pretty much everybody else in the Justice League into the next movie that we're making. But he's really embracing what's happening here because he knows how important it is to bring Batman into this world, especially this new darker Batman like what we talked about on the show yesterday. And Superman going forward, as you bring in more characters into this universe, like what Christian said, it lends itself to more fantastical storytelling where the stakes get elevated. And who's that going to benefit? The guy with the most power. Superman can fly all over the place. He can go off to different planets. So 
as these stories get bigger and they get and and it and it takes up the entire universe and not just one guy going against another guy and feeling each other out. Once you have other powers involved, that's when Superman is really going to be able to step up. So he's biding his time and he's just. I love the fact that he's on this ride that DC's taking him on and he's not complaining about his role or how beefy it necessarily is in one movie. Well, you know that's the unique situation that Henry Cavill he's in a great position because ultimately of what Marvel was able to accomplish with their MCU. And now, because DC is able to do that, he does have all these opportunities now to where Superman ultimately could go. So you could, you're right, with Brian Singer, that was way before the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So there yeah. was only this one standalone movie. Maybe we'll get a second movie out of it. We don't know who we should fight. They didn't really have the the way that the audience has responded. Look at what the Avengers has done. Now you can bring everybody, Guardians, now the Guardians has worked and all this. You could do so much now, like Mark, like you were saying, like eventually, once we get five, six movies into the DCU, he could be fighting everyone and we'll believe it. And yeah. there be, people can come down to the earth and we'll believe it now because they've set that up. It wouldn't have worked in the Nolan universe, obviously, because it was based in that realism. But in this universe they're setting up, there'll be a lot of opportunities for him to fight people that will go, okay, that's believable. All right, what's next? Yesterday, we reported that Jurassic World had taken the number one spot at the box office again for the fourth week in a row, while Pixar's Inside Out had become the highest grossing film of all time to never be at number one. Well, you can throw that all out. The weekend box office results have been adjusted, and Inside Out ended up coming in at number one with $29.8 million, compared to Jurassic World's $29.2 million, a difference of less than $600,000. John, do these results actually change anything? They, they actually, yeah, they kind of do. I mean, for, from two points of view. One, Jurassic World, I mean, they're going to cry all the way to the bank. But, I mean, Jurassic World was now number one for three weeks in a row as opposed to four weeks in a row. Okay, so there's that. And and you can have now Inside Out, which is still my favorite film of the year, by the way. You have Inside Out that can now say it, was, it hit number one at the box office. That's great. However, to me, I was on the phone with a representative from Disney yesterday, and they were like, hey, and don't forget to mention the show tomorrow. You know, Inside Out actually is number one. I'm like, are you happy about that? And should you be happy about that? Because remember, yesterday we were talking about how Inside Out broke a record that I honestly thought would stand forever, which was my Big Fat Greek Weddings record of the highest grossing box office of all time for a film that to never hit the number one spot at the box office. It's like $260 million domestic, some incredibly sick number. And I said, you know, it's it just, it seems like that's a really cool thing you can put on your mantle. <laughs> that's a pretty cool thing other than, ah, we managed to eke into number one in our second week with, with like 20 something million dollars. Okay, that's nice and everything. It's like, yeah, lots of guys have three home run games, but how often does somebody hit for the cycle? <laughs> and you just took away hitting for the cycle. I thought it was more interesting that way, but whatever, Mark. This is monumental because it totally takes back my point of making this the Scotty Pippen of movies That's yesterday. Right. Now I have I can't think of a sports <laughs> metaphor anymore. It's like I, I don't know, but it is good for Inside Out, I think, and it does make a difference because I think you'd rather be number one once. You get to be number one sure. at the box office over Jurassic Park as opposed to just limping on because my big fat Greek wedding was awesome because it was such an underdog story. It's an oh, independent yeah. film. Not a lot of people were aware of it before it came out, and it just even the story about what, what Tom Hanks and uh, uh, Tom Hanks's wife Rita uh, Wilson, Rita Wilson, yeah. what they had to go through just to get that movie made is right. an incredible story. Right. This thing, this thing should be number. It's a Pixar movie. It's a it's a crime against humanity if it doesn't hit number one at some point. You expect it to do big numbers, so I'm glad it is, and it gets some of that recognition. Again, we're talking about six hundred thousand measly dollars, which you know, amongst those gentlemen, is going to be how much we drop <laughs> on my birthday lunch, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that Inside Out finally gets to put the number one crown on its mantle. Yeah, this changes the commercials on TV is all it is. It's the guy hits the button and goes, the number one movie in America. That's, that's really, that's the whole, like, okay, you can release that commercial now. Um, but I actually agree with, with John. Oh, it's number one, Marty. It's number we one. should go see it we, now. We've been, waiting, we've been waiting for weeks. <laughs> this family does not see number two movies at the box office. Well, it's hit number one now, precious. Um, I think that, uh, you're right, though, uh, John. I think it, it's a cool record to have. Because, you know, it, it's going to continue to be in the top five. It's going to be in there for a little bit. It's the only yeah. movie for kids to see right now, for families to see right now. And there was something kind of cool about, we're, no, we're not number one, but we're, the big, but we're, st we're still the, one of the biggest movies of all time. And we don't have to be number one. But it's 600000 bucks. And the one, the one bragging right is, if you want to say, yeah, well, guess who we beat? Jurassic World has been 
beating everything. A monster of a movie, you know. So it's, there's in its fourth week. Yeah, but but <laughs> but I mean they're they're still in their third or whatever. Or second. Yeah, third or second. Third or second. Ones, so yeah. that's just only one week one yep. week apart. So to be able and a kids movie. It's, that, that's an accomplishment all itself. So it's it's like one of these. You can you can go negative or positive. Right, but there's also a kids movie that's coming out in uh, the next week that is going to be number one. The gallows. So you, the, the gallows. <laughs> okay, kids, enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the Minions have a gallows like scene in that yeah. movie. But yeah, I mean, so Minions is definitely going to be number one, maybe for a couple weeks or at least until Ant Man comes out. So you want to have that. Hey, we were number one too. You weren't the only animated film to be right. number one this summer. You know, but but at least I can go back. Well, let me actually throw this as a question yeah. to you guys. I, for a long time, have always believe that my big fat Greek wedding is a record in the box office books that would never fall. Mm. We've had a very weird, perfect storm of events with Jurassic World far exceeding expectations, with Inside Out coming out of the same. Will, do you think that that big fat Greek wedding record will ever fall? Like, remember, 260 plus million dollars and never hit number one. You're saying ever, so I would say yes, because we don't know what ticket prices are going to be like in 10 Let's modify. Years. Five, within the next five years. It's, it, but until the San Andreas quake hits. <laughs> um, the reason why I say yes is because of the amount of just comic book movies that are coming out um, in the next two, three years. With all the DC and Marvel movies, there's going to be another movie in that time that's released during that period that could just be doing well, whether it be like a Kingsman or a Mad Max or something that just keeps piling up and people want to see it. But, but never hit number one. Never hitting number one because they're getting pounded by... Because remember, there are going to be some times where DC movies and Marvel movies are out around the same time. They're going to be eating the box office, yet there'll still be that movie that people want to see that probably hit the two and three and rotate back and forth. It's possible. I'm just saying within the five, next five years, I say it might happen. And also, That's if there's a, a real, point. if there's a family movie that comes out around Christmas, one of my favorite shows to watch is Jedi Council, and they keep talking <laughs> about this it. Force Awakens it. movie. <laughs> so that thing's going to be a juggernaut. That could be number one for a while if another fun movie comes out around Christmas that just keeps eking along. That could take the record. But I think, I think it'll be a while before you get to, I mean, $240 million. That's a lot of money for never coming in number one. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of Rash, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? According to The Hollywood Reporter, Disney has picked up a spec script on a live-action Prince Charming movie. According to the trade, a Prince Charming film is still far from a sure thing, as Disney is currently working on two other live-action adaptations, An Alice Through the Looking Glass, due out in 2016, and Bill, Condon, Bill Condon's 2017 reimagining of Beauty and the Beast, starring Emma Watson and Dan Stevens. Christian Byers sell that Disney will actually make a live-action Prince Charming movie. I'm going to sell it. They're gonna make a Prince Charming movie. Although I, I would like to see the King of the North do it, because um, <laughs> uh, I thought he was really good, and I thought that their chemistry worked, and he's one of the main reasons I think that movie worked overall. So, but I, I don't know. I think with all the other movies that they could do, and now that we know that Sofia Coppola is not doing the Little Mermaid for whoever she was doing it for, that maybe they could actually do the Little Mermaid, and then they're gonna be working on um, Mulan, and there's a few other things that I think happened before they. They hit, I know that Cinderella was a huge hit, so it might make sense to spin off. But I, I think focus on your other properties because, I mean, what are they going to – if they do, I hope it's more than him going, I don't well, my dad gave me in that brand new horse. You know, it's like, it's like what, what are they going to do, they do with this that's guy? Your, that's your opener as a Prince Charming one? That's it. That's it. My dad bought me a new horse. What you I want to met some girl in the woods. It's like, what else does that guy do? He doesn't fight. At least we don't know he does. He can fence. Prince Charming can fence occasionally. Sounds and exciting. Look, th this is the thing. You always have. I'm I'm sick of of just like little girls getting to watch their heroes grow. <laughs> How about a little boy out there who wants to see Prince Charming? You know, he wants to see some rich kid who's never had to you're work really selling his it. life. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> a horse through you're, town. You're, just be a creep. Hey, put your foot in this glass slipper. Let me let me right. see. Oh yeah, that's right. Real. Turns out he's always wanted to do it. He just pretend. He finally finally was able to bottle it up at the end. Yeah. But th th there's never been just. I buy this. Because there's never been just a like Prince Charming standalone story that Disney's done. Prince Charming has popped in in various incarnations into Disney fairy tales. Disney can't keep relying on just, okay, now we're going to do the live action Little Mermaid. Now we're going to do the live action Mulan. Hey, do we have Why any not? other cartoons it's we can make live action? It is, but you should also try to do something new and original. You're right. Richard Madden should be the guy because he was great in 
Cinderella. We can get Richard Madden or anybody else who's pretty good looking. They're going to knock this role out of the park. It's the right move. Pinch Charming and Aunt May. The best thing about the slippers is that I can always see your feet. Um, <laughs> something wrong about that. I'm actually going to side with you on this one. I, I think, look, Prince Charming is a character that, you're right, has several incarnations and has popped up across fairy tales now and again and used, used in many different ways. And I think that means it, the doors would be open to do a lot of different types of stories with this character. And I think there's some pretty cool things you can do. With the incarnation that we saw in Cinderella... And I agree. I thought that was actually a really good incarnation. I thought the chemistry between the characters was great. He was very noble, yet frail at the same time. A lot of cool things. But I just think that the possibilities that exist, when you start the page with, we're going to do Maleficent, you're a little bit limited on what you can do. And when they took too many liberties, I think it, it kind of ruined the story mm -hmm. for me. But when, with the Prince Charming, you can almost do anything. You can create any new story you want within that fantastical world and make him be whatever you want him to be. So I think just the fact that it's got such great possibilities is why for me I'm going to buy it. All right, what's next? With the final Hunger Games film just a few months away, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 has released a new set of character posters featuring the war-painted faces of the series' primary stars. Katniss goes off on a mission with the unit from District 13 as they risk their lives to stage an assassination attempt on President Snow, who has become increasingly obsessed with destroying her. The mortal traps, enemies, and moral choices that await Katniss will challenge her more than any arena she faced in The Hunger Games. Mark Byersell, these new character posters posters. Um, I buy them. I think it's neat that you get to see all the posters together and you get to see all these different groups that are going to have to unite to rebel against this huge, uh, you know, overbearing dictatorship. So when you look at them individually, I think that they strike better than like those Ant-Man ones that we talked about uh, previously. Oh, those initial ones, yeah. So if I saw one of those at the, at the movie theater, it wouldn't pop to me. That's the way I always judge posters. Is if I'm walking out of a movie and I see a poster, is it really going to make me stop and say, oh, I want to see that? So if I'm walking out of a flick and I see Jennifer Lawrence his face painted up like that and I see that little tease it's a nice tease poster and it gets me intrigued as to what this movie is going to be I'm going to Mm, buy the posters, but barely because individually, I, I yeah, whatever. It's Liam Hemsworth who can't act with some red paint on his face. Um, so I mean, or Liam, you know, Hemsworth who can't act with no paint on his face. It doesn't matter. But I, but when you put them together, one big collection like this, it actually looks pretty cool. I almost thought the first time I saw these that it was an ad for a video game. Mm. I, I, at first, right. I kind of did. Like a and fighting I, game. Yeah, yeah, so it's not really recognizable, which is Choose a little bit of a warrior. dig against it. But <laughs> overall, I think when you put them all together like that, and then you know what it is, and you know the films, it actually looks a little bit badass to me. So by a little bit, I'm going to buy it. I buy it, again, just because I know kind of what's going down in this story. And to, to see them all, the fact that they're going after the assassination, this is the symbolism of the Mockingjay on, on their face. The only thing I don't like uh, is, is by putting PETA in there. I think it's a spoiler. I really think it's a spoiler because of the way the last movie ended. Um, the same way they put for the in seven the, people out there who haven't read the book. But no, I'm but, one but of you those put people. It, no, <laughs> but, it's, but it's but it's not though because even if you saw the last movie, the way the last movie ended, he's he's sitting there with with this unified paint on his face. And you're like, well, wait a minute, what's? I thought he was against this, this whole thing. They even did it in the trailer too. So that's the only gripe. But that, as far as the imagery alone, I agree with both of you guys. I think it looks better them all together. Um, but it, it works. It, it's, it serves the purpose of what the movie's about. I think the last Hunger Games movie was so good that all you have to do is just remind us that <laughs> another one's coming out yeah. to get us excited. It's funny. Not a lot of people love the last Hunger Games film. No, I'm actually, I'm I actually you. quite liked it. I quite I got, liked it and, and the ending, the way that it built up, I'm like, oh man, I want to see the next movie right uh, now. It works. It works really. I think it's people are going to like the, the part one so much better after this one comes out because it's going to serve. It really is going to serve like the first part of a great overall movie because this is going to be all action this thing the first oh, one yeah. is all set up yeah. and this is all action i think you got to watch them all together i think more people appreciate the first one because i'm with you i love the first one uh, mockingjay part, part one. one all right what's next as many of you know, an all-new, all-female Ghostbusters film is on the way, and according to a report from The Wrap, two new cast members have been added. Actors Andy Garcia, Ocean's Eleven, The Godfather Part Three, and Michael K. Williams, Boardwalk Empire, Inherent Vice, have joined the cast, which already includes Kristen Wiig, Kate McKinnon, Melissa McCarthy, Leslie Jones, and Chris Hemsworth. The film currently has a release date of July 22, 2016. Christian Byers saw the addition of Garcia and Williams to the new Ghostbusters. Oh! Omar coming. I love, <laughs> I love Michael K. Williams, and and as far as Andy Garcia, sure. I mean, those both strong actors. Why not put him in? I, I would assume Andy Garcia is probably going to play the mayor 
if I was to guess. Oh, that's good. Right? Yeah. I would assume he's going to play the mayor. I might, could be wrong. Maybe they have Michael K. Williams play the mayor. I don't know, but I would assume. Uh, or my, maybe Michael K. Williams plays Leslie Jones' uh, uh, husband or something, too. Has to, who knows? I don't know. There's so much that he could do. I love Michael K. Williams. I want to see more of him. I loved him in The Wire. Um, I, I think that I, I want to see Boardwalk Empire because I heard he was so good in it. But he's so many. You know the movie The uh, Snitch? He was also in with, mm. with Rock. Mm -hmm. There's so many movies that guy's in. So see, they're adding they're adding really good, and they both can do comedy, by the way. Both Andy Garcia and Michael K. Williams. So I'm on board with it. I'm a little bit torn hmm. because as much as I, I mean, I really do like Andy Garcia, especially if he's, if he's in that kind of role like you're suggesting. That really works. I have, have not been exposed enough to Williams doing comedy <clears throat> to really how to pay. I mean, I really like him in Boardwalk Empire. Um, he, and he was the the partner in RoboCop, was he not? Was he not the partner in the new RoboCop? I believe he was. I'll have to look that up. But if I'm thinking of the right guy, I actually quite liked him in that, as a matter of fact. But I don't know. I just don't really kind of... I have a hard time picturing him because of the exposure I've had to him so far. I can't really picture him in comedy, per se. So I'm going to go right down the middle of this and slightly lean towards the cell barely. Yeah, it was RoboCop, you're right. It was RoboCop, yeah. all right. Well, I'm going to buy it because these dudes, while maybe they can do comedy, they're not primarily known for that. And I know Ghostbusters is a comedy. The original is one of the funniest movies ever made, but there's also other elements. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of horror. So I don't want everybody in this movie to be a well-known comedian. You need mm. something to ground the action. That's true. You need something to anchor it so that Leslie Jones and Kate McKinnon and Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy have a place from which they can go off and have these crazy adventures and be funny. You need other people. You need straight men in this, so it looks like that's what these guys are going to play. I'm sure they could have some funny lines. I don't think either one of them is playing Lewis Tully, but I think <laughs> that they're going to be definitely good additions to this cast. Like Christian said, they can act well. I think they're going to ground the action. If there's a Rick Moranis cameo in this movie, I will jump out of my seat. Ah, I miss I that guy so much. Jump out of my seat. All right, what's next? Speaking of actor Michael K. Williams, this is a good week for him. On top of being added to the new Ghostbusters film, the Boardwalk Empire star has also reportedly joined the upcoming video game adaptation of Assassin's Creed, joining Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard. John Byers saw the addition of Williams to Assassin's Creed. Yeah, you remember how I was a little bit iffy on him with Ghostbusters? Yeah, that's out the window. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely bye. Because what I have seen him, and maybe he'll be awesome in comedy, I just don't know. I haven't been exposed to it yet. But what I have seen him in, whether you're talking The Wire, you're talking Boardwalk Empire, you're talking his role in RoboCop, which right. I thought he was really great in. This type of a movie, putting him in, I almost get goosebumps thinking about it. What, thinking of him as some sort of in this league of assassins with like some sort of some sort of badass, whatever. I just get chills thinking about how awesome that would be on screen with his talent that he brings to it. Personally, for me, it's a buy, Mark. Yeah, this is the movie that I would like. I, I saw that and I was like, that is what this dude should be. And because <laughs> I bet he's got some awesome backstory. I'm not that familiar with the Assassin's Creed lore as far as the video game goes, so a lot of that will be new to me. Adding on to this cast too is just good news because hey, maybe we finally start making. This movie instead of just <laughs> talking about, oh, this person might be in it. Oh, it got pushed back. Oh, no, that's just this person's in it. So, Michael K. Williams, maybe he's the straw that breaks the camel's back, and finally we get this baby into production. Christian. Oh, yeah. Huge buy. And <clears throat> surrounding, like, this is what I love more and more and more that they're, they're doing these big budget now video game adaptations with top notch Tier talent, talent. Yeah. like that's what you have to do because if you look in the past some of the reasons why video game movies have failed besides maybe the direction and writing but was a lot was but, but besides, yeah, besides stuff, like the direction but besides the, the direction and the writing, but, but look at the acting look at the actors yeah. in there. They're, they're okay they're they're fine but when you put guys like this in there and you're right with the wire that you could see him already just teaming up with Michael Fassbender i hope he actually is more his uh, confidant than his rival I'll be okay either way, but I'd like to see them work together because he's done that well. And I actually thought he was actually the uh, stupid movie that recently that came out with The Gambler. He was the best part in that movie, too. Right, mm -hmm. right, yeah. yeah. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for Mailbag, brought to you today by our good friends at AMC Theaters. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions, and maybe we can get yours on the show. So, Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Gustavo Velez writes, Hey, guys, I love that the whole group is back together, almost as if the Avengers broke off and got back together for another round. <laughs> I bought tickets to New York Comic Con this October, and it's my first time going to a Comic-Con outside of where I live. Are any of you planning on going to this year's NYC Comic-Con? Thanks and good luck with the new set at Collider. Um, well, thank you very much. And I would be surprised if Schnepp doesn't go to New York Comic-Con. I think he's he planning on going. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but I would also be really surprised if we end up going as a group, like if we end up taking Collider Video and, and going there. Uh, not in the budget. Not, and it, it's it's an expensive proposal to up like eight of us, get on planes, fly to New York City, get the hotels. And uh, so for that reason, I would love to... People have been asking us for yeah. years to go to New York Comic Con, but it's just an expensive endeavor, and I, I don't think so. Do you think it'd be a good idea for us to go? If I could? would love for us to go to New York Comic Con. One of the reasons because I get to go home. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's like, right. I'd be able to see some some people there too. But also, yeah, it's one I didn't get to go, and it's the one you guys were talking about on yesterday's show how San Diego Comic Con's getting a bit overcrowded, mm -hmm. and it's it, th this is I've heard nothing but positive things about New York Comic Con, the way that it has expanded and, and the way that they do, I guess, have regulated the space and stuff, too. So I actually really want to go, and I want to experience it because I've never been there before. So I would love if we're all able to go, but, you know, fingers crossed. I'd love for us all to go. I'd love for Christian to go so you can show me where to get a good slice of pizza. I'll be there either hey. way. I'm going to be at New York Comic Con at least for Thursday and Friday. I'm going to be doing stand-up comedy at Gotham Comedy Club that week, too, amongst other places I'll be popping in. I won't be there Saturday because my aunt's getting married in New Jersey, nice. which we're all invited to. <laughs> Everybody, all the audience? Are they flying us yeah, out? Because maybe, we, maybe no, then we okay. can actually go to Comic Con. Great. That would be amazing. <laughs> okay, then. You heard it here first. All right, what's next? Desmond Bonner writes Love the shows, Heroes, Mailbag, Jedi Council, and have been watching for almost two years now. My question is about the two boxing movies coming out, Southpaw and Creed. I feel like they are basically the same movie. A boxer has to overcome some obstacle and in the end win slash lose in a climactic fight. Do you think fighter movies are too predictable? Million dollars. Our baby kind of broke the mold and a film hasn't been as grand as that in a while for the genre what do you think will happen to the genre moving forward well here's the thing if you break it down to just those elements you're describing 90 percent of any movies because ultimately any movie is about a character who has to overcome some obstacle whether the opposition is presented by another human being whether the opposition is, is provided by circumstance whether the opposition is provided by environment whether the opposition is provided by their own weaknesses or limitations every movie or almost every movie is about somebody faces an obstacle and has to overcome them at the end mm -hmm. that's storytelling it's not just limited to the boxing genre um and to me I gotta be, be honest with you. Like, unlike zombie movies, which while I get a kick out of them sometimes, I mean, they all look the same to me personally. But Creed and Southpaw, despite the fact they're about boxers, I gotta be honest with you. The trailers to me make them look like two completely okay. different movies, and I'm excited about both of them for different reasons. So I, yeah, I mean, if you really want to boil it down to just those essential elements, you're pretty much talking about 75 percent of the films out there. I don't know, Christian. How do you see? I it? agree with you 100. percent I think that it, they look like radically different movies to me because, first of all, Southpaw was kind of is based off like Eminem's life, and that's where where the whole story came from in the first place. As where Creed, basing it off this franchise, and it's I wouldn't say a retelling of the Rocky story, but there's definitely similarities so far what we've seen just in the trailer. Um, but basing it off th this franchise, but as far as boxing goes. Yeah, you have to. You go by that formula in because the, the, that's what boxing is. It's what it's always been. Even it's even. I watched this great thing on Netflix the other day. I think it was just called The Champs, and it's about like Bernard Hopkins and and Mike Tyson, and there were uh, Evander Holyfield, and I think uh, one other guy. And they just talked about how these guys came up, and they all had these obstacles, but what made them diff different characters and how they handled it. And that's what it is in these trailers. Mm -hmm. You have a guy like Jalen Hall's character, like, who's who is like a, he is the champ. He is an undefeated champion who's got to go through this tragedy in order to whatever is defend his title. That's where you have Creed, who's this kid who's fighting in the middle of nowhere, has been fighting and then needs some guidance and seeks out Rocky. So it's all about the characters. If you go back to like Raging Bull, um, or you go back to uh, you, you know all, all these all these old school movies that were all about boxing. It's about the characters and what the boxing does in general. At least for, the good ones are the good ones. But even even the bad ones, though, what boxing always does, even as a sport, it tests you as a person like anyone who talks about boxing you see like it, it shows you what you're really made of and that's what these movies do you're seeing what this character is made of throughout the duration whether it be an hour and a half two hours and that's what makes boxing movies so different is by the characters of the movie listen to you talk about boxing i want to go run 10 miles now i'm like inspired <laughs> that was like a rocky montage right there I, I want to see both these movies for different reasons, too. I'm looking forward to Southpaw for Jake Gyllenhaal's performance. Maybe it's an Oscar-worthy kind of thing. For Creed, obviously, 
the lineage, the fact that this takes place in the Rocky universe. You can say anything you want about Avengers or Superman or Batman. We're back in the Rocky universe, kids. Rocky Balboa is going to be in this movie, but from the trailer, it doesn't look like they're going to be leaning on Rocky being in the film to tell a story. This is going to be its own thing. And if you talk about how, oh, you, you keep going these boxing movies and it has to be this climactic fight, just think about a boxing movie where you get a nice fight in the beginning and then there's just no more fights. Or a street fight, Rocky Five. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, but, but it goes beyond Ooh. that as well. When you look at other combat sports, too, you look at Warrior. One of the things that made Warrior such a great and underrated film yeah. that it is was the characters who relies on that. And I am very excited that now, apparently, that's the one thing I couldn't get out of my head. Watching that Creed trailer, which I liked very much, I didn't seem to like it as much as a lot of other people did yet, but I'm excited for the film, was that all I could think about is they're launching, oh my, like seriously, oh my God, they're launching a Rocky cinematic universe. They are literally, mm -hmm. next comes the Polly origin story, all right? Hey oh. Woman, the Clubber Lang story, <laughs> uh, like whatever, what's that robot that Polly had as a birthday happy present? Birthday, happy, happy birthday, Polly. Happy birthday, Polly. It's going to be, you know, that, that robot's adventure. I want to know what happened to Yvonne Drago's character. I think that he probably started training again to be in the Special Forces, ended up in the Expendables, which you're going to oh. see in Expendables 4. Bring it. It's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, is that it? That's I think it. That's it. That'll do it for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, guys, if you're a movie fan, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and movie ticket information. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel here on Collider Video. Like, Collider's uh, subscriptions on YouTube, like, tripled. No. since yesterday morning so thank you guys for supporting us and supporting show make sure you continue doing so I want to thank first of all the guys sitting here at the table with me first of all sitting over here Mr. Christian Harloff Christian where can people find you online well you can find me on Twitter both Christian Harloff and Instagram Christian Harloff but I have to say to you guys I am blown away by the amount it was funny because when we couldn't say anything yet and I was getting all <laughs> yeah. these tweets about is Jedi Council coming back what's happened with Jedi Council and, and I was really kind of blown away by how much support Jedi Council has. So thank you very much for that. It's coming back, and it's back. We have a special episode today. Special one time today, but then we'll be back every Thursday. Now, I know people have been asking, where do you put questions up? It's going to be hashtag Collider Jedi Council. Put that up there. We'll get, we'll get your questions out. But John, myself, and Mark are going to do a special episode today. So look out for that on this channel. Kind of looking forward, anticipating what we're going to get from Star Wars yeah. at Comic-Con this week. I'm really excited about doing that. And, of course... The birthday boy, Mr. Thank Mark you. Ellis. Birthday. Mark, where can people find oh, thank you? Thank you very much. I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys for all the birthday wishes. And thanks to John and Christian and a bunch of my other comedy and movie friends for popping into a video that my girlfriend produced. You can find it online. I tweeted it out. It's on my Facebook page. So just go to add 5150 Ellis on Twitter and Instagram. You can check it out. And uh, I'll be at Comic-Con all weekend, as will Christian and John. Maybe Ashley shows up. We'll see. Uh, we have the meet and greet that is when? Friday. Friday at 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. in the uh, lobby right outside of the bar of the Omni Hotel, which is right across the street from the convention center. I heard bar. I'll be there. <laughs> and, of course, our lovely host today, fresh off making her first Match.com profile, <laughs> Miss Ashley <laughs> Mobile. All Ashley, right. where can people find you online? Out, boys. Well done, oh, Ashley. Man. Breaking barriers. Yeah, you guys can find me and my new boyfriend on Twitter <laughs> and on Instagram at Ashley Mobile. <laughs> Happy Tuesday, guys. You had to think about Tuesday for a second. I did. And of course, you can follow me <laughs> on the various social media channels on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campion. Hey, listen, guys, don't forget, follow us on Twitter at Collider Video and follow us on Instagram as well at Collider Video. You'll find us there. So that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye bye.